doing, Jamie? Yes. We're all set. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Um, before we get started with the public hearing, um, I need to just um, acknowledge the exit doors. Um, we were reminded of this uh, in a recent uh, seminar we had. Two exit doors in the back. That door over there by John is not an exit door, it's just a closet. That's another door that it's not labeled as an exit, but you can go out there and get into the hallway. So if there's a drop in cabin pressure, masks will not drop from the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody for coming. Before we get started, we have uh, two public hearings. Um, the first public hearing will commence at six o'clock. Um, that's on the fire companies of Malta agreement. So would anyone like to be heard in this public hearing on that topic? And we have no written comments, I don't think, do we, do we Jen? Okay, that being said, we'll close that public hearing at 6.01. Uh, and we'll open the next public hearing on the energy system um, opt-out um, at 6.01. Um, would anyone like to be heard on the energy system opt-out? Hearing no one, and again, Jen, we have no written, okay. All right, we'll close that public hearing at 6.01. Um, would everyone please rise for a salute to the flag and a silent prayer? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, the first item is the town clerk minutes from uh, October 4th. Do we have a motion? So moved. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Okay, our first presentation tonight is um, from NYSERDA on the solar map and a presentation on that. Come on up, can you come up to the podium? Thank you. No problem. You're not late at all, you're right on time. Yeah. Are we do we have a hot mic here? This Hope so. Okay? You guys mind if I take my mask off? No, please, no, go ahead. Whatever you're comfortable with is fine. Um, well, it's nice to be here for an in-person meeting. Um, I believe I had spoken with many of you guys back in, I think maybe January or February earlier this year. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, land use planning and zoning for solar. And this is a much awaited, I'm sure, follow-up discussion uh, to that, you'll excuse me. Uh, my name is Ian Latimer. Uh, I'm a senior project manager on the clean energy siting team at NYSERDA. Um, so my bread and butter is working with communities and local governments around prepping and planning for clean energy development. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here with you guys as a follow up to this. Happy to take questions about this. Happy to take questions about your opt out uh, that you were <laughs> discussing earlier. Not that I'm here for the, the public hearing or anything like that. But um, yeah, so I put together a few slides as uh, what I would say is a great first step in terms of planning for solar energy, which really allows you to take a proactive view of where solar might be feasible in the town. Um, you know, I, I'm not a member of the planning board, so I'm not sure if you guys have received applications for solar already, or if you've sort of staved off interest in solar until you can sort of get your feet underneath you with a planning perspective. Um, but either way, I think this is a useful exercise just because it allows you to reconcile um, basically basic needs for planning for solar with the approach to zoning that you've already used in the town, um, or if you're planning on, you know, renegotiating your zoning or things like that. Um, so sort of what this exercise is good and is not uh, useful for, um, basically we're going to take a, a very rudimentary approach to planning for solar, which really starts with the electric grid infrastructure within the town of Malta. Um, from there, we're going to layer on the zoning log you guys have in the town. Um, I think that this material would have been shared with you guys already. It's not going to be super helpful from this distance for you. But um, if when you're looking at this in the future, you want to like talk through anything, um, please feel free to reach out. I'm happy to do so. Um, it's not going to be an exact science. Obviously, you know, if a solar energy company is looking to develop a project anywhere, it takes them much longer than the allotted time I have this evening to, you know, tell you if it's a feasible area for a project. But again, it's just a good jumping off point to give you an idea of where solar might be feasible um, so that you can start planning for it. Um, a little bit of background um, that I just want to sort of 
layout here. When it comes to planning for solar or for energy development period around um, your grid infrastructure, sort of two things that we want to keep in mind. Um, so there's transmission lines and distribution lines, which I don't know if you guys are familiar with the difference. Um, I was not an electrical engineer by trade. So when I was first getting into renewable energy, this was a learning point for me. Um, but basically, there, there are two different types of grid infrastructure, and they serve different but related purposes. And I often, the metaphor I think of in my, uh, my brain is the vascular system within the body, which is to say that different veins and arteries serve different purposes. They are not the same. Um, and so transmission lines are going to be uh, what we use to transmit electricity directly from power generating facilities to um, load centers or places where people live, places where we need a lot of electricity. And so these are going to be the ones that are mounted up on really large structures, usually in agricultural fields, running down right of ways, things like that. Um, they're usually what we call three, three phase lines, and they start at a voltage of around 69 kilovolts and above. So they're really big, and they're not meant to carry energy directly to your house. They're meant to carry energy from, you know, NIPA, hydroelectric facilities up in the North Country down to, you know, Albany, things like that. Um, some considerations for transmission lines, that's really where you're going to see large scale solar projects proposed is as close to those big transmission lines as possible, because every mile that you get away from a high voltage line, you're talking a seven figure cost to a solar developer. So they're always their first thing that they're always going to be looking at is where is the grid in the area? How do we get as close as possible? How do we find, you know, contiguous parcels or a couple right next to each other that are really near these lines? Um, when we talk about large scale for the purposes of this, I recognize that large scale for most people is, you know, anything that's not what you put on your house. When I use those terms, I'm thinking in, you know, in context of the industry and in context of the solar that we see in the state. So when I say large scale, I'm thinking of things that are over five megawatts. And so a little basic math, if at one megawatt is around five to seven acres, five megawatts is around 20 to 40 acres. So projects larger than that need to be as close to these high voltage transmission lines as possible. And so that means projects that are basically competing with like natural gas plants, competing with wind farms, competing with you know, traditional generating facilities as a wholesale supplier of electricity to the market. Um, and so that's on the left, you can see in your example or in your in materials, there's a couple photo examples. You can see transmission lines um, that are lofted up in the farmer's field on the left. On the bottom right, on the left-hand column, you'll see the oldest large scale project in New York state, which is down on Long Island. It's around 35 or 37 megawatts, um, which will soon be dwarfed in comparison to other projects that are in development around the state. But as of at least you know, a year ago, that was still the largest in the state. Um, on the right hand side, we'll cover distribution lines, which you can think of as the smaller veins as opposed to the arteries of the left side. So these are the lines that are really designed to take electricity from those high voltage lines and distribute it out throughout you know, the community. So again, these can be one or three phase power lines. They're smaller than 69 kilovolts usually. And we're, we're talking about projects that we would consider distributed generation, which basically means Community solar sized projects. Is that a term that means anything to you guys? Community solar, um, different business model, providing electricity to customers directly um, or giving people that. So generally that size project and lower is what we'll consider distributed. And those projects will interconnect directly to a distribution line, not a transmission line. So basically depending on the size of the project you wanna develop, you're looking at two sort of different things um, in terms of uh, the grid map. Um, and just so I know, how much time do I have? So I make sure we have time for any questions. Uh, you know, we don't have a really long agenda tonight, but um, you more. know, we certainly have another 10 minutes. I mean, it, okay. is, that, is that good? That's great. Okay. Yeah. Um, so as a jumping off point, we'll start with the distribution lines. So the lines that apply to smaller scale projects. So utilities in New York state are required to put out what we call hosting capacity maps, which basically give you an idea of where on the grid there is room for additional power. And generally speaking, there is more capacity the closer you are to a substation, um, the closer you are to high voltage infrastructure. And so this is a map of all of the distribution lines within the town of Malta, which means this is where if you were looking to develop like a community solar project, again, 
maybe 10 to 25, 30, 40 acres, that size project, this is the map that you would be looking at. And you would be looking to go to as blue an area as possible because that means there's additional room for capacity. Even if there's not enough room for your project, you can spend the money to upgrade that infrastructure so that you can put a project there. But basically I'm looking, if I was a solar developer, I'd be looking for as blue as possible to minimize the amount it will cost me to upgrade the utility infrastructure there. And so you already can learn things about the town based on the proximity to the infrastructure there, right? You see, uh, I believe that there's, you know, there's a substation right there in Boston Spa. And you can see there's a lot of blue next to, again, proximity to a substation is good. The, the difference though, is that substations are often located in more urban or load centric environments, which is where you're less likely to see solar proposed period, or from a zoning perspective, where you're less likely to allow ground mounted solar because aesthetic and you know, visual impact land use concerns. Um, but you can see sort of in the central part of the town where again, there is, I believe you guys have a substation there, right? Anyone, maybe? I think that there's a substation in, in this area, which would explain um, all of the, the blue there. Yeah, I don't know. Presentations in, indicated that there was a substation in, in the village of Boston Spa. In the village of Boston Spa. Oh, okay. Right. I, yeah, I thought, I thought so. I can try and get the address for you or look it up for you. Utilities, you'll find, and I'm about to get to this on the next slide as well. Um, utilities are often not super uh, public with their substation or grid infrastructure information because of security concerns. Isn't, isn't it tucked in behind um, the hotel there? Um, Fair, Fairmont? Or Fairfield? Fairfield, I mean. There's one tucked back in there, I believe. And that must be it, because if you're pointing to that cluster of blue, that is right around the intersection of 9 and 67, so. So either way, um, all of that goes to say that for, for a community solar project, you know, based on this map, you're looking to see something either within that area, whether we're going out towards local boundaries or something closer in there. We also see some capacity up here in the north, which I believe is one of the more agricultural districts in the town, if I recall from the zoning map. And I'm thinking we'll get to that overlay in just a minute. Um, the next layer to throw on there is the high voltage transmission lines. So again, so we were just thinking about the smaller community solar-ish size projects. Now, if I'm thinking from a large scale perspective, if I'm a large scale project developer, a utility scale project, the only place that I'm gonna be looking within the town is tracing this pink line and trying to get as close to it as possible. So you can see where the high voltage lines according to the utility mapping run through town. There's really one that goes through. And then there's a second segment of the high voltage line that runs over to, I believe that's right where Global Foundries is, which would make sense because they are a very large you know, demand center for, for a commercial enterprise. Um, so from here, the thing to do, and I apologize, it's not like a visual map in terms of like actually showing you the uh, like satellite imagery of the land. It's just a default map in the thing. But um, next thing to do would be to overlay the zoning. Um, and then I'll specifically, I'll scoot forward to, I, I know it's kind of hard to visualize when I make it transparent, but I'm sure that you guys are much more familiar with your zoning map than I am. Um, so I'll go ahead and just skip to the transparency. I have it before. Um, so you do this as a way of sort of seeing how, you know, if you want to take a traditional zoning approach with a solar law, which would say, you know, large scale solar is an allowable use by a special permit within, you know, X, Y, and Z districts. This is how you can choose X, Y, and Z districts if you want to make it an allowable use. Because there's no point in me saying, you know, it's only going to be an allowable use in district R8 and nowhere else. Because if you look at the grid infrastructure, you know that that's, you can't even build a project there. So I guess unless that's your goal is to build a law where you can actually build a project, in which case I'm giving you the answer, only allowable in <laughs> R8. Right. Um, but, you know, if you're, if you're trying to, to take an approach that allows landowners some ability to use their land for, for solar if they want to, while also recognizing that you need to balance it with surrounding uses and things like that. I think that this is a pretty good approach if you want to take a traditional zoning approach. Um, alternatively, 
it's depending on how much you know time and brain power you want to sink into it if you want to take a different approach like a floating zone or um i always forget there's there's two my we got a planner in the room floating and overlay if you want to do a floating or overlay zone whereby you instead of going with traditional zoning districts you actually identify specific <clears throat> down to like a group of parcels even where you think solar is an allowable use and is less likely to have some of the land use or other conflicts that you may anticipate, that is also an option. It would just take you sitting down with this and really looking at individual parcels and areas and saying this is an allowable use. But that can be a bit labor and time intensive. So alternatively, this is a way of saying, you know, these are specific zones based on a desktop analysis where it's more feasible. So for instance, within like, R1 up here, like you know, in the LC, which I believe is it's a conservation district, right? So you know that you're probably not going to want to make solar an allowable use within a conservation district. That's the point of the district, right? So within that, you already know that you're not going to make it probably an allowable use there and there. But R1, you see some capacity on the district, on the district that it's up to there, so maybe reasonable. Plan development district, um, obviously, that's sort of part of the point of a plan development district is adding development to that area. So there are places within there that make sense. Obviously, I believe that this area is a lot more residential. So it may not make sense to do to have an allowable use there, but you can do that through different zoning requirements like setbacks and things like that. Um, yeah, and so just like the, the desktop perspective would say that these are probably three areas that represent the greatest potential for solar solely based on this. Um, again, you don't want it in the conservation district, but that area of R1 offers you large parcels, which means you probably have a better chance of screening the project and having appropriate setbacks. Plan development, it's you know in line with more commercial uses, if that's appropriate. Um, and then C2, which I believe, again, is a commercial district. Um, it's going to be right there right, adjacent to a line that has capacity. Down here, you know, again, you've got the sort of conservation district issue, but you have some more R1 and plan development district parcels that are adjacent to the high voltage line. So if I were a betting man, I would say that these are probably the areas where you're more likely to see solar. Um, I would say if I was taking an approach that was like an overlay or a floating zone approach, I would probably focus on those areas um, and maybe even consider like R5, I believe, which um, also has adjacency to the parcels, although those parcels look a lot smaller, which means it's probably more residential and maybe wouldn't be appropriate there. Um, but again, I would defer to you know, those of you who know the town much better than I do. Um, but yeah, so the takeaways from this exercise are that proximity to the grid infrastructure is sort of the key factor in identifying where a project might be appropriate. If I'm a developer, that's the first step I take. I'd say that those are the areas that I would say are most optimal. And again, the sole substation is located in a more populated area, which means <coughs> even if that's where the capacity is, you probably don't want solar there because that's where people live and not everybody is silly like myself and likes to look at solar. So <laughs> um, yeah, I would say that that's sort of the, the material that I've got for you. I'm happy to discuss at ad nauseum, yeah. I appreciate it really helps us understand how you know how it works the thing um you know it doesn't look like there's a real like natural you know uh fit here it looks like um it'd be hard to you know to make significant solar work here which is to me it you know the question is why aren't large scale if the goal is to push large volumes of renewable energy into the grid in New York. Why aren't why are we talking about this when we should be talking about large scale solar farms in fallow areas of New York State that are abandoned from agriculture that have the 765 kV line running through them or something? Why are we trying to, to put a square peg and a round hole here <laughs> when there's so many easy places in New York State that are no longer in active agricultural use yeah. because it didn't economically work anymore. Yeah, it's a, good, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, like the town of Hounsfield or the town of Watertown. Well, the, 
if only the folks from Watertown could hear you say that because they've got three large scale projects I know they in development there. I mean, yeah, the, I know they um, the, the truth of the matter is that it's not that we are trying to put or like the state is trying to put a, a round peg in a square hole. The state is trying to put every peg in every hole there is, right? We're, we're actively deploying a shocking amount of offshore wind. We're doing large scale solar and wind all across the state. Um, and I mean, I, I think what you're sort of what you're seeing here in terms of the, you know, the small, the small peg is that this is just, you know, every town is different. And like, you can look out in the town of Alabama and Genesee County, where they've got large scale wind and solar that's in development. You've even got a green hydrogen plant, which is a whole other thing, which we can talk about if you're ever curious. But I mean, the, the short answer is that uh, solar on agricultural lands is one piece of it. And some of that just has to do with the topography of New York State, which is that we are heavily forested and we're heavily agricultural lands. And I mean, NYSERDA even has a program called Build Ready, where we are explicitly looking to develop large scale solar on brownfields, former industrial sites. We're doing one at an old Land, mine. Landfills. Yeah, Land, land, oh, we already do landfills. landfills. Yeah, the yeah. problem with yeah. landfills is that you can't get bigger than like a community solar size project yeah. on a landfill. We've yeah. got incentives and there's like, I think at least 15 to 20 solar projects on landfills across the state that are already built or in development. Um, and again, NYSERDA is like, my, my colleagues who run this program are explicitly looking to develop projects on underutilized lands. The problem is that the scale of the, the problem is huge. And so it really takes all approaches. It takes community solar, it takes rooftop solar, it takes offshore wind, it takes you know people switching to hybrid vehicles or electric vehicles. It's really, it, it's a complex problem with complex solutions. Um, well, I think Elon Musk said, you know, if we all convert to uh, electric cars, there's nowhere near enough electricity to charge them, right? That's, I mean, that's why, system. that's yeah, why so. you, you overbuild renewables. I mean, the, the future of electrification requires, you know, a lot more renewables and then you need low carbon fuels as a supplement to that, which is where the green hydrogen piece comes in. I mean, again, it's, it's, it's a really complex problem. And I, I think it's easy to feel like the, the solar and agricultural lands conflict is a really, like it's a prevalent part of the, the conversation. And I sort of got a working group devoted to solar and agriculture that brings ag and markets and other players to the table to, to really hash out, you know, how to make these things more compatible. Yeah, I guess what I'm talking about is, and I don't want to distract the discussion too much, is there are, you know, thousands and thousands of acres in northern New York from whence I come that have that are no longer in agricultural production that have been abandoned because farms have been abandoned uh, some of which you know high kv lines run through yeah. those are the places you know to my way of thinking that you should be doing big scale projects. yeah and i i, I think that the, the hard part is creating a a mechanism for those sites to make themselves known or for those landowners to bring those sites forward and the program I referenced before, the Build Ready program, we put the call out to counties and county IDAs across the state, basically saying like, come here, give us ye, you know, give us ye sites that are underutilized and good places for solar. Um, because those are specifically the types of projects that we are looking to, you know, to build. I think if, if you could ask anyone in the state of New York, if you could only build a project on an underutilized land and not take an acre out of agricultural production, I think everyone would would throw money at you to you know have that answer. I think the problem is that the again the scale of the problem has sort of necessitated an all hands on deck approach, and I think that that's where you see projects of all sorts, all shapes and sizes, and locations that are coming forth. So I, I'll say this: you know, if you have specific parcels in mind, send them my way. I would love. Well, to... take take a drive across the old <laughs> military highway across the top of New York State. You know, there's a lot there. Yeah, drive around well, rural St. Mark's County. I mean, the part of the challenge of that too, though, is that it's it's not enough to just build a project, but you need to get that pro that power to where it's needed. So, I mean, the state's investing a lot of money in transmission lines. There, I'm sure you guys are familiar with the uh, the Champlain Hudson Express building this new power line that will run down the Hudson. Um, a, a large part of that is meant to carry hydroelectric power from Canada down to New York City. Um, but they're also investing in um, transmission lines, new and upgrades all across the capital region because um, we've got a lot of congestion in the lines here. So 
I mean, that's, that's part of it too, is that like, you know, not as many people live in St. Lawrence County as live in, you know, Albany and Saratoga and Schenectady, even down to New York City. Yeah, so the nice thing is there's a 765 TV line runs right through the town. So sure. Yeah, and, and, and that may be true. It may be true that that line is filled up with electricity from NIFA hydropower up in that area and that it can't take on additional lines. I mean, there are people a lot smarter than me who are the ones that, you know, when you apply to develop a project, you go to the utility and you say, is there room here? You sp let me rephrase. You write them a check for thousands of dollars and then you say, is there room here? And then they spend months <laughs> doing a very complicated uh, like analysis of if there is. Um, and so, you know, even the place where you have a great, let's say you have an underutilized site and it's right under a transmission line and it is otherwise perfect for solar. If there's congestion in the line and there's no room for your project, you're looking at a seven figure bill to upgrade the line and, and build a substation and everything. So it's, there's a lot of moving pieces is, is really the problem. You mentioned uh, hydrogen. Um, what's nicer to is, um, uh, are they really gearing up? Are they seeing a, you know, a future in hydrogen? We're looking at it closely, um, definitely looking at it closely. NYSERDA announced a few initiatives earlier this summer, which is basically taking a very high level overview of hydrogen. We're doing a study with the National Renewable Energy Lab, which is a DOE funded uh, research laboratory out of Colorado. Uh, we're working with them right now to basically do like a bird's eye view. What is the capability of hydrogen within the state? Um, basically just recognizing that there are, you know, very specific difficult to decarbonize industries that hydrogen can be an answer to. Um, the whole world is really excited about hydrogen right now. And obviously we in New York have the benefit of really great players that are based here. We've got Plug Power. You know, there's a number of other really great companies in New York who are very gung-ho on hydrogen. Uh, and that's sort of perspective is that we are, uh, you know, we're very interested. We've got these programs and efforts that we've announced. Um, as of now, we have not, you know, put together any direct incentives or programs to develop hydrogen, but um, it's definitely a space that we're interested in and, and looking at. For both generating electricity and powering vehicles? Um, I'd say, you know, from my understanding, and again, I'm, I am not the hydrogen guru of NYSERDA, yeah. I would say that everything is of interest to mm -hmm. us. We haven't, there aren't any particular use cases or technologies that have you know, we're directly funding, but um, others in the state are already really interested in that. Plug Power is going to be generating green hydrogen out in the town of Alabama, as is Lindy out in uh, Erie County or Niagara County, Niagara County. Um, everyone's interested. <laughs> yeah. I'm extremely interested in that very effective um, source of energy. I have one question. What is the state's goal for solar and wind as a percentage to fuel the grid in the future? 70% by 2030, carbon-free grid by 2040. The other 30% is what? Um, by 2030, I believe the, the other 30 is the nuclear that's still online and then any natural gas that's making up the, the difference. Basically replacing current, uh, yeah, replacing current natural gas with new like wind and solar and hydro that we're bringing in. My concern is that a very large factory as the grid is now, it takes hours to start up in the morning. And I don't see how wind, solar can ever feed that. Let's talk. I mean, I mean, let's talk batteries. Huh? Let's talk battery energy storage. Well, it, it, it's, it's hard to start a large plant up right now. Yeah, no, I, it I'm takes sure. hours early after a Sunday to even start a plant up. So my feeling is that if wind and solar are going to go forward, it, something else has to feed it that is a lot more, I mean, has to be flexible and it has to be on demand really quick. Yep. You don't just start up 
a factory quick. Yep. You start a gas turbine up quick. It'll eat it. And it's going to be awful hard to uh, rely on the uh, sun and batteries and not lose jobs and manufacturing in the future. It's going to be a couldn't agree, tough couldn't call agree for seventy percent. Believe me. No, I couldn't. I couldn't agree with you anymore. I, I will say that. Um, you know, the again, I am very privileged to often be the dumbest person in the room because my colleagues are some of the smartest people. That's in not the room. true here. I have that. <laughs> I don't know. He's making me feel pretty. pretty I have bad. thirty witnesses that will swear that uh, I have that privilege. No, but I mean, what you're saying is you you couldn't be more right. I mean, the I mean, I'm not just... the words that get thrown around are we call it firm and dispatchable energy. So yep. capacity that you know is there and that you can dispatch so that you, you know that, that right on, the on it will be. exactly and so the 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 main technology as of now that's made itself available as a complement to renewables is the battery energy storage which for a lot of needs is great you know most batteries in terms of like the large scale utility batteries are usually like a four hour storage um, which is great but there's also a lot of work going into long duration energy storage projects um, as well as that's another area where people are interested in hydrogen is that hydrogen gives you, you know, hydrogen is not an energy creator. It's an energy storage mechanism, basically, because you're taking electricity to make hydrogen and then you use it in a fuel cell or you combust it. And again, so there are, you're a hundred percent right. And the need for firm dispatchable capacity is like very front of mind for a lot of people at NYSERDA. Um, our energy storage program is really robust it's underway i believe that the first like large-scale battery or one of the first ones that we built is at the luther burbank technology campus which is not far from here um if you ever want to go look at a battery i can do my best to make that happen um but all of that goes to say that like you're you're completely spot on and you know solar and wind is not the only thing that is being looked at solar wind and hydro are just kind of the feedstocks that we know are reliable that we know that we can build um, to I love hydro also. <laughs> I love hydro too it's, it's just really it's a great source of energy it's it's a great source of energy it's really hard to permit and build in 2021 um, because try doing a new plant what you say <laughs> try doing, doing a, a new, new one oh that's a plant oh sure that's yeah. like 30 years yeah and the, the the dam you know the dam infrastructure capacity is beyond its useful life in a lot of cases yeah. of what's there yeah and i mean i i think that you know there is an interest in repowering existing hydroelectric facilities that are across the state every year i sort of does these solicitations for large-scale renewables and every year we have awarded at least one hydro repowering project again really everything is on the table and we've got programs that are that are trying to make everything funnel into the more track that works okay Thank you very much. Yeah, we really appreciate it. Excellent yeah. presentation. Uh, any follow-up questions any other time, just please let me know. I'm happy to. Happy Thanks to for driving up here. We'll do that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Very well done. Okay. Our next presentation is on the State Farm PDD amendment application. Good evening, Mr. Shoot, Supervisor and uh, members of the town board. My name is Charles Gottlieb from the law firm of Whiteman, Osterman, and Hannah. I'm a land use counsel for Shooting Star Properties, LLC, who is the applicant, uh, commonly referred to as Mohawk Chevrolet, uh, seeking an amendment to the State Farm PDD number 22 to permit automobile sales and service uses on a small portion of property that is already within the, the, that PDD boundary. Um, here this evening with Paul Lubera from Lansing Engineering, as well as Jeff Harden from Mohawk Chevrolet. On October 1st, we submitted a petition to amend the PDD. Within that petition, we set forth a proposed local law, a red line of our changes to the State Farm PDD 
as well as a proposed uh, exhibit that would be a part of those regulations. The proposed amendment, um, the current State Farm PDD is a total of eight parcels, uh, the uses of which are controlled by the current zoning code regulations. The State Farm PDD is also regulated by, a, I'm calling it an Exhibit B, and within that Exhibit B, it sets forth the uses that can be permitted within the State Farm PDD. Our proposed amendments are to allow automobile sales and services within a portion of the PDD area. Automobile sales and services are already defined by the zoning code and we're not seeking any changes there. Uh, it would allow for these automobile sales and services for approximately five acres uh, on property known as 101 State Farm Place. It's just below the existing Mohawk Chevrolet facility. Um, no other changes are proposed to the PDD. We're not taking away any uses that are currently permitted. Um, the text amendments include merely adding automobiles and sa automobile sales and service to the expansion phase of the PDD. Uh, Mohawk Chevrolet's existing facility is at 633 Route 76. <clears throat> So it's just north of the PDD boundaries. That facility is actually in the C2 zoning district. It's not in the State Farm PDD. But what Mohawk is seeking to do is to develop just south of their current location uh, for a detail center that would be approximately 11,295 square feet. And there's a concept plan in Exhibit C of our October 1st submission uh, that kind of generally shows you what, what the idea is and which Paul will go through. Um, the project, again, does not change or expand the PDD area. It simply seeks to add the automobile sales and service use. Right now, the State Farm PDD really only allows office, hotel, and service-oriented uses. Um, we're seeing a decline in office space use as a result of the pandemic, more people are working from home, uh, offices are on the decline. Um, contrary to that, I, I think you heard Jeff on the way in talk about the demand for cars and um, how that will be on the rise in the near future. Um, we also took a look at the comprehensive plan. We believe these proposes, proposed amendments are consistent with the comprehensive plan. The current comprehensive plan notes that the I-87 exit 12 slash 67 corridor uh, should be a significant opportunity for business expansion. It's exactly what Mohawk Chevrolet is trying to do with this application. The proposed comprehensive plan updates also encourage commercial development along the Western segment of Route 67. Um, so unless there's any questions for me specifically, I'll hand it over to Paul to Go through the site plan, sure. Um, one of the things that struck me a little bit um, atypical in the red line language was the notion that the town board would be involved going forward with some kind of specific building approval. Um, we've gotten you know, out of the business of uh, the town board acting as a uh, you know, super planning board. Uh, it, it, what was the thinking behind having the town board involved with choosing a, or, or determining whether a building was going to be acceptable or not? And the language seems to be a little bit ambiguous about whether the town board can say yes or no, or can you help me understand better what, what you envision with respect to that language? Sure. And, and certainly that language can be malleable, you know, based on feedback received. Um, that was actually, I just took sections from above in that regulation that related to service oriented uses and use that exact same language that was already in the PDD regulations. Um, so to the extent that the town board is looking to move away from that design, that can certainly be reflected in any draft. But I tried to make it as consistent as I could with the regulations as they already exist. Um, but I can certainly play around with that language to you know, the satisfaction of the board. Thanks. Oh, 
Hi, my name is Paul Rivera. I'm a Lansing Engineering. I apologize for my easel not. So let me know if you need to see it. I can, I can hold some stuff up for you. Um, <clears throat> we're we're um, planning to use five acres of the 25 acre parcel. It's on the northwest side of State Farm Boulevard. Uh, it's about 1300 feet south of the intersection of Route uh, 67 and State Farm Boulevard. Currently it's vacant land. Uh, surrounding uses include automobile, automobile dealership as uh, stated before, uh, insurance company <clears throat> and office space. Um, there are some wetlands located. along the northeast side we will have them delineated um, we're going to include one 11,295 square foot um, auto detail facility the building height will be approximately 21 feet uh, we've included 394 parking stalls for expansion um, we're anticipating to utilize the existing setbacks uh, that were for the approved uh, Mohawk Chevy uh, next door and um, we possibly one wetland crossing across the north here to connect to the existing facility. Uh, utilities will be provided by Clifton Park Water Authority, Saratoga County Sewer District, and stormwater will be managed on site somewhere in the station area. Any questions? All right, thank you. Any any other questions? So I just want to make sure about I understand the, about um, the project or about. I mean, uh, did you guys have uh, any additional segments of your presentations? Or are you ready for questions about the whole project? Nope, ready for questions. Okay, shoot. So I, I, just as I look at this, there's. There, I just want to make sure I understand. You're, you're talking about eleven thousand square foot uh, a building, a detail center. Um, then just above it, you say proposed language to allow for a maximum footprint of hundred thousand square foot entire building. Can you just kind of clarify the, those differences? Sure. So um, again, we took those numbers from other sections of the code. So those can also be malleable. But one of the things we were thinking was right now, Mohawk is contract vendee for that five acre site. Um, in the future, if the town board uh, sees um, progression in this area for automobile sales and services, it may consider locating other areas within that PDD to allow for automobile sales and services. And that's what that large threshold might stand for. Um, right now, it's only that five acre parcel, but I added those same numbers in the local law to give flexibility in the future. So let's say if you go with that language um, and then in the future, another automobile sales and service operator wants to come in, all they simply would have to do is amend that exhibit B, which would be the map that goes with these regulations as, the, as opposed to additional text amendments. Um, but that is certainly within this board's jurisdiction to accept, consider, what have you. Got it. Thank you. One thing that's gonna take me because I'm the slowest one up here a, a bit to kind of think through is the, the PDD has a 6040 uh, green space requirement generally, right? And there's also, isn't there, I, I don't know whether it's included in that calculation or not, there's there's a, a designated undevelopable area of 20 plus acres somewhere. Is that included in the 6040? Yes. It's um, included in the 6040. Right, so when I uh, drafted up that amendment, I had um, Scott Lansing, uh, who's also the project engineer on this, right. take a look at all those calculations to make sure any future development, um, certainly as we have planned it, but into the future wouldn't run afoul to that 60, 40 green space. Because what you're, what you're doing on this parcel is you're doing almost 100% development, right? So that, that, that reduces the developability of the remainder of, the, of, of this PDD, right? So what we would be doing is, So, like I mentioned, we're contract vendee for this parcel. Understand this yeah. parcel's uh, included in this parcel I, right now. Yeah, I've so looked at all the stuff. Yeah. What we'll do is just a lot line change when the time comes, um, so that this will be one lot. This part will be State Farm PDD. This part will be C two. I understand, but my my question is, you're proposing to do 100% development of this area that we're talking about allowing? Okay. 
So that would cut into um, the residual development that's available in the rest of the, the PDD, right? Yeah, and what we yeah. could do is run some numbers so well, you can have an analysis of what other development developable lands there would be. The, you know, one of the questions I'm asking myself is, well, why, why not just take this parcel out of, but it, it, is, it, is there any great value to having this parcel remain in the PDD? Couldn't we just rezone it as C2 consistent with the, the parcel that is fronting on uh, 67? Um, because it, it is somewhat, um, you know, discreet from the rest of the campus because it's immediately behind here and it, it's along a road. Um, what do you think about that as a concept? So it's funny you say that because when um, Jeff and his colleagues came to our office, that was one of the first things we looked at was why not just zone this in the C2 um, because it would potentially work. Um, we thought this might be the cleaner approach because it involved less changes to the zoning code. Um, but we can certainly take a look at that alternative and see what it would look like. It would get us to the same finish line. Yeah. The, I, I'll be honest with you, my, you know, my concerns are um, for the impact, potential impact on Settlers Ridge North and South. I don't, you know, I don't know what that will be. Um, we're increasingly running into issues of, um, you know, conflict between abutting commercial and, and residential property. So that's a concern. The other concern is left hand, you know, turn movements from westbound traffic uh, going in. You know, how, how many more trips, you know, how many more left, left hand turn from westbound traffic are we going to get through there? Because it's, it's a problem. Unlike the rest of the State Farm campus where you can access it through that roundabout, Mm -hmm. And I suppose if people knew that they could get around that way, you know, they, they might be inclined to do so. But, um, you know, you are going to reduce a bunch of left-hand turn movements uh, with additional, you know, business development at that property. So those are, those are my concerns. The plant, you know, the planning board will look at them as well. Yeah, certainly. And, and I appreciate that because we can you know, have that included in any type of traffic assessment that we do and uh, consideration of signage directing uh, traffic in the appropriate way to go and so forth. Yeah, that was going to be my question is that it didn't appear from my review of this that you were, there was an expectation that this was going to really drive any increase in traffic. No, but, but as I understand the language, you you want to have that right possibly in the future to have retail. I think that's just being put out there. That's what we're looking at is parking our inventory back. Right. Also cleaning and the right. Parking, parking, parking. But is, is there any future of putting another dealership back in there too, or? Not about that five acres, no. If we open, it's what I'm I mean, the, the trade-off is, is we would be able to, by keeping it in the PDD, we'd be able to have greater concern to address Cynthia's point here. On the other hand, if we pull it out of the PDD, you're not gonna be able to develop it to the extent of 100%, right? Because you're gonna have a green space a requirement for that parcel, right? That you're gonna have to satisfy. Right, we'd have to take a look at and kind of rerun the zoning compliance table as it would apply to the C2 district. Right, because what you're getting by leaving it in the PDD is, is you're getting the green space benefit of all the other undeveloped land in there, right? Because you're not gonna provide any on this parcel. Correct. Yeah, okay. The staff notes here also reference that, you know, the, the original um, dealership had to have uh, some sign specifications. I, you know, I, we, we're not talking about changing any of that. No, no BDD. 
but you're not anticipating any signage for this additional. We took a look at the. Oh, we'll know it's back there. <laughs> we took a look at the sign language that's in the PDD law itself, and the design team saw no problems with compliance. Is the I don't even know because I haven't been back there in a while. I know the state court system leased a chunk of the vacant property, but I don't. You know that main building that abuts this property with the large parking lot. Is there anybody in there now? It's my understanding that that old State Farm. Well, I don't know how old it is, but um, <clears throat> that it is largely vacant, if not um, completely vacant. I think so. Yeah. yeah so they, they claim they have it all lined up, but I don't see any. State they would Farm be Boulevard. they would be using the roundabout. Yeah. And State Farm Boulevard is a private road, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, one of the things that the board might think about is, um, you know, do we want to refer this to the planning board on uh, November 4th at our, at our regular meeting? Um, would the issue of potentially pulling this out of the PDD and converting it to C2 be a problem with referring it to the planning board? I mean, I don't think so. We do have a deadline to refer, right? So um, shall I put that on the agenda for the fourth to, you know, for the board to consider whether to refer this to the uh, planning board? That would be my preference. I'm happy doing that, but I, you know, I'm going to be, I try and be straightforward with people. I do have, you know, those concerns that I, that I mentioned. The impact on, uh, you know, Settlers Bridge properties is, is a, you know. Sure. And, um, yeah. you know, what we'll do is, you know, we'll address the comments we heard tonight um hopefully prior to november 4th so we can also inform the planning board of the comments we heard from this board um and then when we come back before you um hopefully we'll have some of those items addressed uh, to your pleasure and have we can discuss some alternatives to any type of zoning you know one last thing and this is you may have this figured out already i, I don't know if there's a there's recorded you know declaration of covenants or anything that um, you know, that tie into any of these issues. Um, you know, that's the case over in the Mid Coast Tech campus. Not only do we have the zoning code, there's this you know, very extensive recorded declaration that kind of repeats a lot of the zoning code. Sure. I don't know if that's true here. If there's, you know, a private road, if there's like a, you know, commercial homeowners association issue that's presented. Sure. I, I just don't know. Um, we'll look into that. Not that I have seen thus far, but there's a, a transactional attorney in our office working on this who will get to the bottom of that. Um, luckily, I'm just the land use guy who gets to do all the fun night meetings. Um, but that's a good point. And, uh, you know, we'll take a look at that as well. One of the things that I think might be helpful is when, you, when we discuss this next time is looking at the, uh, the area that would remain between this proposed project and the, and the neighborhood behind. If you can get us some detail on how, how big, how much space that is currently, how many feet that is. That looks to be a pretty good chunk of mm -hmm. undeveloped, heavily vegetated area. Yeah, yeah, I'll, yes, that, that finger. I think that will help uh, a great deal. Tim, are you talking uh, basically that, that narrow area right yes. here? Yeah, yeah to it's the a west. strip to the west. Right. But you I'm know, looking with, at that, I'm sorry, I'm, look, I'm looking at that distance from uh, where this proposal would be to uh, the back of, as to John's point, Settlers Bridge uh, North in this case, that looks to be about roughly 200 feet, I think, from roadway to the edge of that, where the PDD line is right here. Mm -hmm. You know, my concern in it. Correct, yeah. yeah. You know, I, I know Jeff has dealt with this issue at his other facilities. You know, one issue would be light impact, you know, off mm -hmm. the back. Um, I know there's ways to manage it, but I, you know, I want to understand what the impact is and how it would be planned to be managed. Sure, absolutely. Okay, fair enough. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Very nice. Thank you very Appreciate much. Appreciate it. Thanks for coming.
Okay. The only action item on our agenda tonight is to set a date for a public hearing for the preliminary budget for 2022. So moved. Second. Discussion. One quick comment on it. Um, uh, board thinks that this is a very responsible budget. Um, one uh, kind of significant change we've made is to recognize that our workforce here in Malta um, is a sterling workforce. Um, we've had some increased difficulty in retaining and in uh, attracting. Um, in addition, we've had an unfortunate resurrection of inflation. Um, and on the other side, we've gotten a little bit more money in um, uh, sales tax from the county than we had originally planned. So um, this preliminary budget works in um, a raise um, for our employees to meet realities. Um, the supervisor's uh, salary is still commensurate, so that's not going to change. Um, I wanted to change the um, salaries of this town board. Um, uh, because they work a lot. And if you work it down to their hourly rate, it's teeny tiny. Um, so I tried to get that across and completely failed. So I was the sole dissenter on that. And I think it's probably the only time I was sole dissenter in my three years. But at any rate, the town board is refusing to take part in that. But um, I think it's going to be a, um, a very worthwhile uh, change um, in our town staff. Um, any other discussion on the preliminary budget? Just one thing I want to add to that, Darren, is, you know, as we see the sales tax numbers continuing to be strong, you know, when we first started back in 2016 when, with, with Vince DeLucia here, as we changed our approach to doing business, we, we, there was a lot of discussion at that time. We thought it was going to take probably 10 years to really start get, getting sales tax revenue flowing in the way that it, it should here, given what was happening around us. And what has happened in a much shorter time frame uh, is is definitely beyond all my wildest expectations and what we're able to do in terms of service delivery and now being able to finally start paying our employees closer to what they're worth um, is is I, I think a huge victory for for all of us uh, to to have gotten to this point and to have gotten to this point so quickly. Um, and we look out there and we're seeing positive signs left and right uh, in our downtown and throughout our town um, where this philosophy has worked and worked quickly, uh, much quicker than any of us had anticipated. So um, bravo to our staff and to our, our leadership here that helped, helped bring this uh, across the finish line. Thanks, Tim. Any other comments or questions? Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Carried. Okay, we move to the item on for um, discussion tonight. Uh, that's the um, engineering sewer professional services proposal. Um, this went to um, the uh, committee that evaluated the several um, applications we had for it. Um, it was a little more difficult than usual because it wasn't one where we could you know, readily identify a lowest um, bidder. It just isn't an RFP that looked like that. Um, so we went through a process of attributing um, scores to various categories, et cetera, and, and you have that information. So the question for the board, I think, is um, what would you like to do? Would you like to just take a look at, at, the, um, at the recommendation from that committee, or would you like to uh, meet personally with any of the applicants or like the top three or something like that? So that's just kind of open for discussion. I guess, you know, my, my thinking here is, you know, with the three, the top three that have been, been identified are, are relatively close points wise. Um, I have less familiarity with the top scoring uh, vendor than I do with the other two. Um, I, I, I think they're all highly competent and, you know, I, I trust the, you know, the, the, the recommendations here that have been provided. Um, I guess if, if Darren, if, if you and, and, and Kevin and Jamie, I think, were you the third? Yeah, um, you know, have any, any, you know, strong feelings one way or the other, uh, I'd, I'd love to hear it. But um, I, I think, you know, we, my opinion will be go with, with the one that has been scored the highest, unless there's some reason not to. I'd, I'd ask for an executive session uh, to discuss the employment history of uh, 
these firms in regard to our potentially contracted with them before we make a decision. Okay. Um, do we have to do a motion on that, Steve? Uh, you want to do that? You want to do that by motion? Yeah. Okay. Uh, John makes makes that motion for executive session. I, I will be asking for an, an executive session on another little issue, so bear that in mind. Do, do we have a second? Combine the two. Do you want to do that at the end? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to do them both at the end. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was going to do. Propose okay. to yeah. have it at the end. Okay. So we'll take a motion on both of these things at the end. Okay. Don't let me forget that. Okay. Um, anyone on the town board have any announcements or um, statements they'd like to make at this point? Just that the Rotary Pancake Breakfast is on Sunday. Uh, we do a good breakfast. It's $7 for adults. And I forget what it is for children, but wear a costume if you want. Um, you know, it's usually pretty popular. It'll be at the Round Lake Hose Company. Uh, Firehouse will be serving from 8 a.m. to I think 11:30 a.m. So, eggs, sausages, pancakes, yeah. juice, coffee. Yeah. That's darn good. We usually have a lot of. Uh, it's all you can eat. And we usually have a lot of uh, satisfied customers. Oh yeah. And we do good, good with the money. We, you know, we all the money goes back into, you know good projects, some local, some international, so. And the food is donated from who? Uh, Stewart's, Stewart's. Stewart's donates a lot of food. Hannaford donates a lot of food. We buy some, but. Thank you, Stewart's. All right, any other comments from the town board? Uh, just one quick thing. Uh, apparently this just came to my attention recently. Apparently there's an election next week. <laughs> um, just encourage everyone to please make sure your, uh, your participating early voting is open right now. Um, election day is uh, a week from tomorrow um, and make sure you uh, flip the ballot over and pay attention to those uh, measures on the back of the ballot. There's, there's several to both statewide and uh, pretty significant of, of importance for the, the ambulance district here and, and uh, the local level. Thanks, Any, anybody else? Uh, yeah, Darren, um, briefly. Uh, just want to give a shout out to the, the folks in town of Malta that provide our fire protection. Uh, last week I was out campaigning and actually uh, heard sirens that went on for quite a while in the area that I was in. So uh, some things you just can't get out of your blood. I knew they were fire trucks. So away I went and uh, observed, uh, unfortunately, a fire of uh, substantial magnitude on Rowley Road but watched our folks that uh, volunteer their time to, to battle that fire as well as some surrounding departments as well. And uh, just want to say thank you and acknowledge what they do uh, for nothing, basically. And uh, just wanted to give them a shout out. Thanks, Mark. They do do a fabulous job. Absolutely. Is that how vacant, Mark? It I was. believe it was, yes. It was, yeah. Yeah, then foreclosure, I heard too. I, I just point out that um, in the course of fighting the fire, the pumper trucks went over the Nelson Avenue bridge and drew water from the other side at the Saratoga Springs hydrant, mm -hmm. uh, which is the closest hydrant to fight fire in that neighborhood. Wow. Closest reliable hydrant. Reliable, yes. Good point, John, because that was the first thing that I thought of. I heard this scanner and they were all talking about pumper trucks and i'm thinking you know what they don't have water there it was no, it was quite a blaze there was nobody in the house no exactly yeah. that was my first concern when yeah. i pulled up but it was relatively soon after it uh, the trucks had just gotten there so so thank god no one was injured but again thank you to those folks for for doing what they do absolutely department heads um do we have anything for him from department heads okay Questions or comments from town residents? Would anyone like to address the board? No Kathy. 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 No it's not the same, is it? Okay, uh, moving to our meeting on uh, November 4th, which remember will be on a Thursday um, next week, not on a Monday because of the election and getting this room ready for 
uh, the election. So just bear, in, bear that in mind. Um, we will um, first have the public hearing that the board just voted on. So we'll have the public hearing on the 2022 budget. Um, we will, uh, I think Mayor Wilbright from the Village of Boston Spa will come in to talk about uh, that property on 407 Malta. And just for the board's information, uh, I've had a discussion um, with the mayor um, and we discussed, you know, the kind of sense of the board. Um, uh, you know, basically I, I told him that the, the, the board, everyone on the board would like to help their fellow municipality. Um, but there was, were, you know, concerns that this property is, zoned LC, um, there were some concerns about um, traffic, et cetera. Um, but nevertheless, uh, I, I told the mayor that the board was very willing to hear him. And so he did wanna take us up on that. And so I think he will be here on the fourth. Um, okay, we'll have a discussion about the town hall renovations, um, the possibility of some, uh, Shazen is working on it now and we really don't have any kind of preliminary thoughts on it, but um, we asked them to take a look at it because we um, are hiring additional people and especially with the need um, uh, shown by COVID to have some separation in the, in the building, we're having trouble finding space for everyone. Um, so hopefully we'll have some more information next week and we'll be able to show that to the board. Um, okay, the cable franchise agreement is up. Um, you know, I, I think there's a possibility to uh, finalize it, you know, we'll discuss that next week. Um, you know, there's a, always a problem with this kind of agreement, as I'm sure the board well knows, um, because there isn't like a lot of options um, in, in terms of the cable arrangement. Um, but at any rate, that's on the calendar for next week for discussion. And, Derek, yeah, could, John. Could we uh, plan some time for an attorney client um, conference with Steve to discuss that? instead of uh, discussing it in an open session? Sure. Um, I, I don't think we'll be ready to do that tonight. Um, no, no, I mean on the 4th, yeah. Oh, okay, if, okay. If we could plan on discussing that in, in turn client. Well, why don't, we, why don't we just, we can discuss it in an executive session after. I mean, it's not like we have to act on it on the 4th. I mean, there's nothing that's gonna make us act on it. So we can have it in a regular executive, executive session. Yeah, I'm not sure it's legit for executive session, but I think it would be you know appropriate for attorney client conference. Oh, that's so what I meant, can, right. We can work, work that yeah. out. Attorney client after the meeting on the 4th, right. Okay. Okay, um, the next item will be, um, uh, you know, taking into account any comments at the public hearing to adopt the town budget for 2022, if possible. Um, then to adopt the fire companies of Malta agreement that we had the uh, public hearing on today and the energy opt-out uh, opt um, uh, system that we also had the public hearing on today. Um, scale of charges, kind of a routine thing that comes, comes in, um, we'll have that on the, uh, on the agenda for the fourth. Designation of town health, dental and vision. Uh, Kevin, is there anything we need to talk about that tonight as opposed to on the fourth? I provided the information to the town board uh, in your, your folders. It shows uh, the rate increases. I think they range between seven and 8% for our two uh, providers, uh, MVP and CDPHP. Town also reimburses uh, the health reimbursement arrangement, the HRA uh, deductible, and also a portion of the uh, health savings account. So both the uh, plan summary with the rates and a proposed draft res resolutions there for your review. All righty. Any other discussion on that item right now? Um, next, we think we've got a, um, or we definitely do have Kevin, uh, a part-time clerk for your office. Yes. Okay, so hopefully we'll be able to appoint her. Um, excellent candidate. Um, and hopefully the same is true for a uh, planning technician. And hopefully Jamie will be able to appoint him um, to start relatively soon, right? Okay. Um, the next part will be to amend uh, the town manual to correct what I think is... is uh, probably a shortcoming in our manual to arrange for some sort of um, uh, extra time for the 
part-time workers in Kevin's office. So um, Kevin's provided some material for the town to, for the uh, board to uh, explain the need for that change. Um, it's a fairly minor, minor change. It's not only for my office, it's anyone that would qualify for that. Okay. Any, right. So right. there are additional, uh, additional employees, uh, I think currently two that would also qualify. So, Oh, there are current ones in addition to those. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know, it's all dependent upon the hours they work in the prior year. If they're going to exceed 700 hours. They would qualify for a, a reduced amount of leave. Gotcha. So. Any questions for Kevin on that at this point? Okay, budget transfers, we'll probably have some of those next time, Kevin? Uh, yes. Okay, other town business, do we have anything else? Any other comments or questions from town residents? Okay, at this point, um, there's, there's gonna be a most, there's already one motion for executive session and uh, hopefully we'll have another one to discuss a, um, a, a litigation matter. Um, with our attorney. Um, and as I do all the time, um, after this executive session, we'll reconvene the, the general meeting, but uh, we don't plan to do any business, uh, have any substantive discussions or anything else. So um, I, I don't think there's any real purpose for anyone to stay uh, and wait for that, but you're more than welcome to if you'd like. Do we have a, a motion for the executive session? I think John made one. So moved. Well, let's just clarify, because we're going to have two parts. We're going to move to discuss litigation litigation and, and a procurement do we need two separate motions for that do we need two no, motions no. darren yours is a litigation matter did i understand correctly yes all right and then mine is a procurement matter that will involve discussing the our contract. history, uh, you know, particular qualifications or uh, our experience with uh, particular uh, vendors um, that would bear upon our decision to contract with those vendors. Okay, uh, Craig, I think you seconded that motion. I did. Okay, any other discussion on it? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Yeah. Carried. Okay, 